You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So Glenn, we have a new revelation from the January 6th committee transcripts that may implicate Jared Kushner now. Um, I'll put the transcript right here on the screen from Alyssa Farah Griffin that says, quote, it was the first COVID like morning meeting that Jared Kushner led after that had been announced and Dr. Burks raised, she said, well, should we be looping in the Biden transition into these conversations? And Jared just said, absolutely not. And then we just moved on. So given what we know about the dangers of COVID, does Kushner have any legal exposure here? He does. And I'm glad we're getting to revisit the topic of criminal liability for how the Trump administration badly mismanaged. And that's putting it mildly, because I think much of their misconduct was intentional, not just negligent, but why they really do bear criminal responsibility for avoidable COVID deaths. So now we have this new revelation in this transcript where Dr. Bricks had wanted to include the Biden administration in COVID briefings during the transition period, right? She wanted to make sure that there was a safe, smooth, informed transition. And Jared Kushner said, absolutely not. He disrupted that safe, smooth, informed transition. Now, does this surprise us? No, because if you recall the reporting, that um, Jared Kushner was quoted as saying, look, at the moment, COVID is impacting, it's affecting blue states more than red states. So let's just let it run rampant through the states. Brian, I have maintained all along, and I've talked about this a number of times, that the way the Trump administration handled the pandemic um, really does give them criminal liability. Why do I say that? So for 22 of my 30 years as a prosecutor, I was handling murder cases in Washington, D.C. I was trying them. I was supervising them. I was responsible for overseeing all murder cases in the courts of D.C. while I was a federal prosecutor. And, you know, if you look at the law of homicide, let's just take the law of D.C. as an example. Each jurisdiction, each state and the District of Columbia has its own laws on the books and it defines uh, homicides and the different levels of homicides in slightly different ways. But I think we all kind of are familiar with first degree premeditated murder, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter. Some jurisdictions have what we call negligent homicide. I'm going to use the laws of D.C. for this discussion about the liability of the Trump administration. So there's a relatively low level of homicide called involuntary manslaughter. And there are three elements. That is, if somebody does three things, these three elements, then they are criminally responsible for involuntary manslaughter, for death of another. Let's talk about those three elements. And then let's talk about why Trump and Kushner, and I want to talk for a minute about Mike Pence, who was the head of the coronavirus task force, while Trump and Kushner were creating circumstances that allowed for avoidable COVID deaths. So I think Pence has responsibility too. Let's talk about those three elements. First element is somebody acted in a grossly negligent manner. What does that mean? They did something that was just kind of reckless. It was really negligent. And there are actually two ways that you can fulfill this first element. I hate to make this a Crim Law 101 class, but bear with me for a minute. Somebody either acts in a grossly negligent way or they have a duty to act like they're the president of the United States and they have a duty to faithfully execute the laws of the country. They have a duty to support and defend the Constitution and they have a duty to protect the American people. They have a duty to act and they fail to act. And that failure is grossly negligent. I maintain Donald Trump actually satisfies element number one in both ways because he acted in a grossly negligent way and he had a duty to act and he failed to act in a grossly negligent way. Anyway, that's a mouthful, but that's element number one. Element number two is that the person's negligence put people in harm's way. More precisely, the person's gross negligence was reasonably likely to result in death or serious bodily injury to another. And then the third element is that the person's negligence or their failure to act um, caused the death of another. And that's where a lot of people back up and they say, well, you can't really prove that Donald Trump caused the death of another. And that sounds good on the surface, but when you scratch below the surface and you look at how the law defines causation, 
Causation simply means that your grossly negligent conduct or your failure to act was a substantial factor in bringing about the death of another. Not that you killed them, not that you shot them or stabbed them or strangled them, but that your conduct was a substantial factor in bringing about the death. Now, let's let's apply these elements to the known conduct of Donald Trump and by extension, Kushner and also Mike Pence. First of all, did Donald Trump act in a grossly negligent way? Did he put people in harm's way? Well, let's see. He lied to the American people about the dangers of the pandemic, right? He has now admitted to Bob Woodward in private interviews that I always wanted to downplay it. He didn't want to tell people the full truth. He didn't want to give them the tools that they could then use to protect themselves. He said, it's going to go away like a miracle. The warm weather will kill it. You have nothing to worry about. And here is one of the things that he did that I think best exemplifies how it is he was grossly negligent. Remember, there was a, a White House press conference and terrific reporter Jeff Mason was asking Donald Trump a question, and he was wearing a mask. Why? He wanted to protect himself. The CDC was recommending wearing masks to protect yourself and others to you know, deter transmission of this deadly virus. And what did the president say to Jeff Mason? I can't hear you. Take off the mask. Jeff Mason said, no, Mr. President, I'm protecting myself and others. He said, oh, oh, I see. I see. You want to be politically correct. Think about it, Brian. What yeah. message did his base take away from that? that you are worthy of being mocked by the president of the United States if you wear a mask to protect yourself and others. And here's the thing, you know, Americans should be able to rely on what the president is saying and doing and make their life decisions accordingly. So you know he was grossly negligent. Did his gross negligence um, result in, uh, was was it reasonably likely to put people in harm's way? It absolutely was because he was contradicting the very guidance that we all knew would protect the lives of Americans, would slow or um, prevent the transmission of this deadly pandemic. So the first two elements, check and check. Let's go to the third element. Did Donald Trump's negligence cause the death of others? We have a, I have a concrete example that I like to use to illustrate why the answer to that question is yes, Donald Trump committed the crime of involuntary manslaughter because he checks all three boxes. So when I was chief of homicide in DC, we had a case where a robber was chasing a victim down the street. The victim was trying to evade the robber and he ran between two parked cars. He darted out into the street. He was struck by a vehicle and he was killed. Now, did the robber kill him? Did the robber cause his death? Well, not literally. The driver of the vehicle caused his death. But this highlights how the law looks at causation. Causation is a substantial factor in bringing about the death. And the robber chasing the victim into traffic was a substantial factor in bringing about his death. I I know I've gone through a whole Prim Law 101 class, (laughs) on the law of involuntary manslaughter. Thank you for bearing with me. But but this is why I absolutely believe as a former career homicide prosecutor that Donald Trump is criminally responsible for avoidable COVID deaths. So let me follow that up with this. You know, we, we've we seen how difficult it was to even start an investigation for something as egregious as an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. So. Given that, what's the likelihood that that we'll see prosecution for something that's that's murkier like this? The likelihood is low. And I say that only because I am looking at what appears to be an absence of prosecutorial appetite to take on these avoidable COVID deaths, which I think is inexcusable. I have, believe me, I have talked to my prosecutor friends across the country because there were avoidable COVID deaths that um, that occurred in every single state in the union. So I think every local prosecutor would have a reason to at least investigate the possibility of criminal liability for Trump, for Kushner, for Pence. And yet we certainly haven't seen any charges. And I'm not entirely sure why that is other than 
This would be a very forward-leaning investigation and prosecution if it were brought. And Brian, you and I have talked about the fact that no prosecutor seems to be determined or seems to have the appetite to be the first one to indict a former president for his crimes. I have maintained all along that once that dam breaks and we have one brave, strong, determined prosecutor indicting Donald Trump, all of the others will follow. I would I would offer too that a big part of why we're not seeing any movement uh, in the judicial space when it comes to COVID is because there was so much mismanagement in the beginning, but because this entire thing was politicized uh, by the right while we were in the midst of COVID and because masks became an issue of politicization, because vaccines became an issue of politicization. Basically, now you have half of the country on that team. And so it makes it so much more difficult because any prosecution, uh, even even in the realm of, you know, uh, avoidable deaths is going to be criticized by half of the country as if it's some political witch hunt because they were able to politicize all of these issues. And so by virtue of bringing half of the country onto that team, it basically creates this buffer where now prosecutors are not going to be, you know, willing, not going to have the appetite to bring forward any prosecution because it's going to feel like it's political, even though it's not. And it's actually to seek some accountability for what were wholly avoidable deaths in this country. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. That's the dynamic at play. But once we start to make prosecutorial decisions based on how many people are on team crime versus team justice, then I think we are done for. But I I couldn't agree with you more that that may be one of the serious impediments to any prosecutor bringing the first case for an avoidable COVID death. I I still hope it happens because, you know, we have had more than 1 million Americans die of COVID. You look at, for example, South Korea, where, you know, the first case of coronavirus was diagnosed in South Korea the exact same day, January 20th, 2020, as the first coronavirus diagnosis in the United States. Um, South Korea, I think, handled the pandemic really responsibly, its government, its leadership. You know how many folks died in South Korea? 32,000. 1.1 million died in the United States, but let's norm that for the population because South Korea has a little over 50 million uh, folks. That would put the a comparable sort of per capita capita death rate in South Korea at about 190,000 versus 1.1 million. Brian, as sure as I sit here, given my experience as a homicide prosecutor, I'm telling you, the extraordinary number of COVID deaths in this country are attributable in part to Donald Trump's criminal conduct, his grossly negligent, at, at best, mismanagement of the pandemic. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Let's finish off with this. You know, is there no irony here in the fact that Republicans have made Dr. Fauci enemy number one uh, in the United States of America? And yet we have proof here from this transcript, for example, from Alyssa Farah Griffin uh, in her testimony that Jared Kushner was willfully neglecting to allow the Biden administration uh, to know what was happening with COVID, that, that, you know, we have um, proof within the myriad of ways that you laid out that Trump was aware and yet did nothing. And yet not a single person on the right will, will, you know, uh, uh, raise issue with this. I don't understand it because, you know, that kind of worldview or view of our nation is really more keeping in line with the North Korean government or the Russian government, where they just don't care about the welfare of their people. And I never thought that that's, you know, that is how any American leadership left, right or center felt or comported itself. And yet, you know, right now we have apologists for the Trump administration not just for the many crimes of Donald Trump, but for the homicides of American citizens, the involuntary manslaughter as a result of these needless COVID deaths. And I sure hope that um, we sit up, we take note, and that prosecutors nationwide begin to hunker down and at least present these cases to the grand jury and let the grand jury sitting as the conscience of, of the community decide whether there's enough evidence to charge Donald Trump, Jared Kushner, and Mike Pence.
Yeah, and it's a, it's, it's a shame that we have to push for this uh, amid the opposition from a party that brands itself pro-life. But, uh, you know, just one more example. Uh, Glenn, thank you so much for, for keeping this issue at the forefront. For anybody watching, if you want to get more legal news, make sure to follow both my channel and Glenn's channel. The links are right here on the screen. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.